No, I think it's still on. Oh, Thank you. Oh, very good, Joyce. You got that. Um, wow. Okay. So welcome, everybody. This is, uh, I think, the third in our, oops, why is that there? Okay. Well, I'm, <laughs> and even though my video is on, my, my uh, computer has lost the camera. So you'll have to not see me, but, uh, but hear me instead. That's very radio of me. Uh, uh, anyway, welcome. This is the third um, in our salon series. The theme is beyond the web. And that doesn't mean that we're at web three. What it means is that we're looking beyond the way that our thinking about being online has been contained uh, by the web model and the way the web model has been implemented for the last uh, better part of 30 years is on what's called client server. We're always the clients. Others are always the servers. That's why we're always consenting to their terms. That's why we're always sort of trapped like pinballs in many different machines and they're in charge of the machines and we are not the machines. We wanna move past that. And um, uh, I'd, I've written some about this. I'm not gonna go into that. I'd rather jump as fast as I can into, um, into, into Robin's work. Robin is uh, most, most famously known as uh, the, the co-founder, but really the inventor of Zipcar and um, completely rethought the way that uh, car rental ought to be done and, and how the collaborative economy um, can operate. She's written a book about it, Peers Inc. And uh, I don't want to delay any further. So Robin, just jump into it. Okay. Edu Edumicatus. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen. And my sure. intention is, I tell you, this, this group could go so many different directions that I just chose one and we can. Okay. So I kept thinking about the Ostrom, about the Ostrom connection. And so here we are, I'm going to give a short talk. And then I am saying to you overtly, we can go in a thousand different directions talking about this. So I feel like the last 20 years for me have been all about exploring sharing and what does the word sharing mean and what doesn't it mean and what are some benefits of that and so I want to say I think that sharing does have this tie-in with the commons and that you know a goal for me about sharing is creating abundance and value and diversity and um, before I give any talk I want to just say why I'm interested in doing this like the thrust for my life these days is addressing climate crisis and so I wanted to just center this a little our this talk a little bit in that and so we have um, if we want to get reach, if we want to reach one and a half degree warming we have to reduce emissions 50 percent over the next eight years which sounds totally implausible and so you're thinking we'll never do that we're just going to go straight on to two and so this is, um, what's the difference between one and a half and two degrees? And I'm just gonna show a few things here. So Arctic sea ice, the difference between one and a half and two degrees is we'll have once in 100 years at one and a half degrees, no sea ice, and with two degrees all the time, just basically every year, every decade. Um, coral reef decline, we're gonna be losing most of the coral reefs, which you can think of as nurseries for the whole oceans at one and a half degrees. And at two degrees, it's just 100%, no more coral reefs. Um, think about humans, you know, that we'll have a one and a half to two degrees is you double the population that's exposed to water scarcity. And if you think of, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, water is pretty much getting towards the rock bottom of what's possible. So I really, really care about the urgency of climate change. And I think in everything I'm thinking and doing these days, I'm really focused on what does a new equitable and sustainable economy look like? And I talk to a lot of innovators and I get a lot of things across my desk and, and questions to do things. And I feel like, is this part of the new economy? If it's part of the new economy, I'm interested in putting my time and effort into it. If it's not part of the new, new economy, I'm not interested. So, you know, kind of briefly, what would that look like? It's gonna be much more local, both local sourcing and local innovation. Um, I think the value of work would be more honest. I think capitalism really falls down on the job of recognizing valuable things. Um, just overtly, let's talk about care work, for example. And a new sustainable economy would have much more transparency around what the rules are, which we'll get into. 
and more participant engagement. So I really feel this climate emergency urgency that honestly, what can I be doing to speed this pace? And I put this little note to myself, evolution versus revolution. Um, over the last now five years, when I've given talks to large, large audiences, so between 30 and 1,000 people, at some point, often towards the end, um, I ask this question of the audience, and it doesn't work on Zoom, and so I'm just going to give this framing. So here's my, my survey question. Do you think that existing companies and existing governments will evolve fast enough to address climate change and income inequality? Or will they move too slowly and the people will rise up and revolt? So reflecting on the next five to 10 years, is it one of evolution or is it gonna be one of revolution? And I ask people to take this anonymously. And the answers I'm getting are, now that I've got it, people doing it anonymously, is 80 to 90% of the people um, raise their hands on revolution, which is a terrifying prospect. And I know it's a fake question, you know, I'm just pushing people to do this, um, to ask this binary question, but it really is to say that existing companies and existing governments are not doing what's required. They are not moving fast enough. They're not, and people really have lost confidence that they're going to respond to these issues. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from. And so I wrote this book, Peers Inc. I wrote it five years ago, and really it was my learnings of, the, of building a platform company, which I'm just going to talk us through, and how we can use this new organizational structure to address the world's most pressing issues. And for me, that would be um, climate change and its corollary of um, how we address arrange our economies and income inequality and racism. So going to, I'm gonna zoom through these talking points and then get to things that are kind of related to the Ostrom issues. So what I really understood with, and I'm not looking at the chat, so someone else is looking at the chat. I can't focus on that and give this talk at the same time. Um, so if I think about um, Zipcar, why we succeeded is that we were leveraging excess capacity, meaning that the way people could consume cars back in 2000 when I founded this company was they had these two choices. One, you buy a whole car, which sits idle 96% of the time, and it's your most expensive or your second most expensive asset. So there's this huge amount of capital wasted sitting in your driveway or on the street that you're not using, or you could do car rental and you know, if you want it for two hours, you can only rent it for 24, right? It's in these 24 hour bundles. So you always had to consume more than you did. And so Zipcar said you can rent it by the hour, by the day. So we unlocked this excess capacity and that transformed the economics of the proposition. So that was number one. The second thing we did, and this is back in 2000, is we built a platform for participation. Meaning that back in the day and still today, I am dumbfounded that if you wanted to rent a car, you have to go stand on that 15 minute line and talk to them and do all these things. Whereas Zipcar said, we're gonna give you access to the back, back office. You're gonna choose a very specific vehicle for the time you want it and you're gonna get in it by yourself or taking up the middleman, you are, you're connected directly to that asset. And then the third thing we did is we thought of our customers as collaborators. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, I would say, where should I park the car? What kind of car? What do you think of the service? Who can do all these things for me that are part of, you know, what we need for the service? I really went to them first for most of my questions. So I thought of them as these co-creators. And I love these two photos that were sent, which just kind of really illustrates for me the ethos of those early years is these are people leaving the hospital with their firstborn children and their instinct was, oh, hold up, let's stop and take a photo and mail it and send it to Zipcar. Like how many of you have ever imagined doing that to a company? Um, but we were really tightly tied to their well-being and in their lives. So it's these three elements, these excess capacity people and platforms that for me is forming this now quite ubiquitous organizational structure that I was calling Peers Inc. And I, and I, so people and platforms are inventing the collaborative economy and reinventing capitalism. And I was saying this in a frame of everyone talks about platform companies or the gig economy. And I really wanted to emphasize that it's, the gig economy only works because we have platforms and platforms are only useful because we have all these people participating in this, this, this double, this coupling here. 
and that excess capacity and unlocking that excess capacity is this amazing transformation of what we can get accomplished. And so all of these companies are these platform companies and they're all leveraging this excess capacity. And I'm really using this in a, in a broad way. So I would say free and open source software is a, is a form of a platform and, you know, Airbnb and lending club, club and, you know, Upwork, co-housing, co-work, co-financing, Bitcoin and the blockchain, which we'll talk about later. All of these are taking this organizational structure. And so as I was writing this book and thinking about it, I was thinking, what is, what is happening here? So if we think about industrial strengths, which I feel the whole previous hundred years was um, industrialization, and it was figuring out what is the power of the large. And so what can large things do? What are industrial strengths? They can make big investments over multiple years with, with lots of types of specialization and then this standards and it's kind of built together in this brand province and they're doing these things that only big entities can do but on the flip side it turns out there are these things that individuals can do that are way better and i want to say individuals as in local and small companies and those are what do they do they do this customization and specialization and localization in a way that industrial sized companies can't don't want to and they spent the last hundred years saying i don't want to do that i want to make everything these big standards but as I put these two together, it turns out that they're very, very complementary. And what has changed is the internet has completely transformed the cost of transactions. And so we can now have this new collaboration that I'm calling Peers Inc, where the Inc side is building this platform for participation and the peers are delivering that diversity of offering. And I kind of, to simplify this talk, I think of it as a kind of a yin yang, where it's this complementary coordination um, swimming in this sea of excess capacity. And so the ink is bringing the power of scale economies and high growth and standardization to the peers. And the peers are delivering this diversity of offering, innovation, specialization, customization. So I'm not going to here you go. So it's this diversity of offering that is brought by them. And the excess capacity part is really interesting and particularly acute for me at this moment, as I think of us in late stage capitalism with seven plus billion people on a very finite planet, that we really need to figure out how to be much more resource efficient and, and from an economy standpoint, cost efficient. So shortening this talk right up, that's kind of what the book was about. And a colleague of mine who's been doing a lot of work in the sharing economy was saying, okay, Ramya, you know, we went from selling products to selling services to putting that kind of those, that offering into a kind of platform format. And if your platform becomes so huge and ubiquitous, you really want to eventually become a commons. And that there's this kind of transition. And I want, as I was thinking about this today, I want to say that it's not necessary that there's a whole bunch of things that are going to stay products. There's things that are going to stay services. Not everything's going to become a platform and not all platforms will become commons, but there's this winnowing and certain aspects of those do come down. So while I was thinking about this, it became clear to me that the economics and the power of platforms now that we have almost, almost ubiquitous access to the internet, that everything that can become a platform will become a platform. And, and laboring on a platform economy has a lot of issues that, that we will discuss later. And, and the, the, I've been asked a lot at, from in California where they did a, they produced a law that said it was illegal that all Uber and Airbnb drivers were actual employees and people, or people wanted me to weigh in on $15 minimum wage for Uber and Lyft or for other drivers. And I feel like for me, our economy is so broken way beyond that, that I'm not interested in fiddling around whether are you categorized as a gig worker or a freelancer or contract worker, or there's just so many ways that people, that companies have tried to avoid taxes. And that the bottom, the real bottom line is we need to have national healthcare and better social safety nets and workplace rules that are not tied to full 
employment, that we've way moved off of that. Um, and the other key piece is that he or she who finances these platforms creates the rules of engagement. And I invite people to talk, to ask questions about um, cooperative plat co-ops and cooperative platforms um, because I have strong opinions about what it takes to build a platform and how much it costs and, and moving to these platforms. When I was writing this book, I realized, oh my God, and Eleanor died by the time I wanted to talk to her about all these issues, is I realized that labor platforms are commons because the definition of her commons was that it's tied to your economic livelihood and it's very, very hard to exclude people. And I thought, oh my God, all of these labor platforms are in fact commons as she would call them. And so therefore let's go look at how do you make these commons succeed? And so I really love her eight principles for managing a long-lived commons. And as I look at them, I feel like they apply to every single labor platform that I can think up. Um, but one that really strikes me is this ensure that those affected by the rules can participate in modifying the rules. And for me, this is the this is a fundamental problem with the labor, these labor platforms is that we don't invite the users don't get don't get to create the rules of engagement. And so Airbnb or Uber or Lyft can just make up the rules and, and then that's that. Um, you don't have a way to deal with it. So I really feel that Eleanor's work in this has been a real touch point for me and what makes a better and worse platform and how we think about labor platforms. So moving on, because I really, I really want to get to Q&A. Um, many years ago, I want to say like 2004, people were talking about collaborative production it was, and because the Mechanical Turk was coming along. And I thought, wow, how interesting. You know, I could recast Zipcar as collaborative consumption. It was many, you know, 30 people are sharing one car. We're gathering the consumption of 30 people to, to consume this one car and then effectively kind of to finance this one car because I'm getting all these people who want just a fraction of the car together so I can buy one car that they can share. And so I really felt that Zipcar kind of expanded this idea of collaborative production to collaborative consumption and collaborative finance. And since I started Zipcar and while I was writing this book, I became totally fascinated by um, the blockchain and cryptocurrencies and what did they enable? And some of the things that they can enable from Doc's perspective, um, they really transform identity politics and that's interesting, but I'm also very interested in what they do for governance and for financing. And if I think of this collaboration on transportation products, so we think about ride sharing um, or other types of, or other, or other car sharing, the blockchain cryptocurrencies make this collaborative financing much easier because I used to say that, that Zipcar was totally enabled by the internet that makes sharing very specific resources easy among lots of people. The blockchain enables this supply chain tracking and micro payments are really, really simple. And so we can think of cars or electric bicycles or solar panels and local grids being owned by specific people who are getting micropayments for actual use on their actual product in a kind of cooperative way. So it's, it's, a, it's cooperative and it's collaborative, but the blockchain and these cryptocurrencies are making it a little bit easier. And if we could think through those new local collaborative shapes, um, one would hope that it would also enable us to do much better letting the users and the owners of these assets to create the rules of engagement. So coming down the home stretch here, I'm gonna remind you that I'm totally fascinated with what are these new tools and these ways of thinking, how do they help us make this new equitable, sustainable economy? And um, repeating a sentence I didn't say, why I'm so fascinated with platforms is I think they can bring speed and scale unlike anything that we can do one of, and we have so little, little time. Um, oh, shoot, I'm just gonna take myself off of sharing because you're not gonna get to see these. Um, 
because I didn't do the right color background. <laughs> my closing remark, my closing remark is, um, I've said for many, many years, um, I want people to build the world they want to live in. And what I'm struck by is, is we need to build the world we can live in. We have gone so far. It's not that I, I you know, I want to build the world that I want to live in, but more importantly right now is we've got to build a world that we physically can as breathing entities actually survive in. And so that is um, really important to me. And I'm going to say, because I do see this, two other slides I wanted to, to talk to. Um, if I think about, I really believe that we are profoundly moving towards this new collaborative economy where the old days we had a company and we would build this hard shell around it with copyrights and patents, trade secrets, uh, certain requirements to get in it. And so it was all the stuff inside the company is profoundly mine as demonstrated by this big thick barrier I've put around, put around it. And we're moving into this collaborative economy where it is not a hard belt around the company. It is a very, very fuzzy, fuzzy thing where who owns this asset? Is this work time or personal time? Is this data from far away or near? You know, it's all the ownership and use cases and types of use. It's all very, very diff diffuse now. And to say why I profoundly believe that this sharing collaborative economy is the future, I'm gonna share with you four things that are truisms, I believe. And if you think they're true, then you too know that we are moving towards this collaborative economy. So we can say and know that shared networked assets have more value than closed and proprietary ones because they are used more efficiently and you can find out more ways to innovate on, on them and do new things. Um, more networked minds are smarter, more local, more diverse, more innovative than fewer proprietary minds. So the people inside, there's more smart people outside my company than inside my company. And to be Trumpian, counter Trumpian and say, there's more smart people outside my country than inside my country. It's just a fact, it's a numbers truth. And now we have the internet, we can find and identify those people. So more networked minds are better than fewer proprietary minds. Um, the benefits of shared open assets are larger and greater than the problems associated with open assets. Yes, there are problems with sharing things, definitely. That was Eleanor's life's work, figuring out how you overcome those problems. And it was what I did with Zipcar. So somebody will leave a potato chip bag in the car. Okay, we'll deal with that. You know, some people will treat it poorly and we'll, those, those problems arise up and you deal with them. But the benefits of these shared network assets are so much greater. And we can think about Wikipedia when it started. It's gonna be filled with lies and junk. Now we say, wow, it's, you know, the world's largest encyclopedia and how incredible. And then lastly, if I think, you know, what are humans? Maybe we can say that we are selfish and self-interested, but when I participate in one of these collaborative economy things, I get more than I give. So I personally, Rob and Chase have access to tens of thousands of cars around in major cities because I'm a member of Zipcar. And and all I have to give is my use case when I use it, because I'm now contributing to the purchase and placement of those vehicles all around. So cycling back to how I think about this moment of time that we're in, I feel this Peers Inc. Yin Yang collaborative organizational structure is the network for these incredibly dynamic and terrifying times because it's a structure that enables us to experiment and iterate and evolve and adapt as quickly as possible if you're paying attention um, in a way that the old shaped companies could not do. And so that is all I have to say. And um, I'm back and I can look at comments or you can tell me what you wanna talk about. Um. I want to tell people that, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Claps go on here. The Isak is clapping. Um, others are too. Um, uh, so people know you, uh, I see there, there's a couple of claps. People know how to operate the clapping thing. Uh, <laughs> raising a hand to talk is also an option. Those are under reactions. Generally in the bottom of the screen, there's a little smiley with a plus on it that means reactions. So looking at, at those, 
um, uh, we'll take them in order that I saw them anyway. So first Bruce Preville and then followed by Johannes. Uh, thank you for the provocative um, introduction and uh, thought, thought provoker, especially. Um, I, I wanted to just ask about this notion of uh, collaboration in the commons. I know that uh, there's two aspects of that that I'm puzzled by. One of them is if we were to somehow uh, invigorate, enliven the commons in, in, with, with uh, 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 systems or you know, ways of managing the information so they become alive and become a, a resource for people uh, and go beyond, plat build on the idea of platforms, but somewhere beyond that. Um, the question I have is, is how do you, how do you handle the area of governance, the people who are, for whatever reasons, misbehave and who make themselves, uh, you know, troublesome and begin to undercut the value of the commons by, by through their noise or their damage. The second question is, um, the, um, how do you enable the commons to, to I, I would see that at the heart of the commons is some sort of platform that enables people to get, to become part of it um, and independent of geography. And yet, and yet that takes money to invest and people who are paying attention and tending to and fortifying you know, power in, in empowering the, the the commons as an entity, and and how do you monetize that in such a way that um, uh, it's not you know scraping off the money and routing it to some some uh, people who are uh, sub either subverting it or have designed themselves into the center and then walk away rich. Um, I think that you are you are pulling up the issues that. I think are so relevant. So in this book, Pure Zinc, I had this kind of epiphany chapter around towards the end of the book. And it was really talking about this, I feel like it was like my blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, chapter that people, there's, there's a dream around cooperatives. And, and I feel like it is so, all of us who've done volunteer, volunteer service on anything cooperative, you get so worn down, so worn down because people are not realizing the effort. And I call this the volunteer coordinator problem, just mm -hmm. the level of effort to hold it together and to do all these small things. And the, and this is where I felt the blockchain was kind of brilliant, but the, these, these things that have worked well have had, I want to say deus ex machina who come in. So Linus gave us Linux and Satoshi gave us the blockchain, but, or here I'll put, I'll put in the same category, Tim Berners-Lee gave us, you know, HTML, the web. Right. And so without their unbelievable generosity, those things would never have happened. And so I feel like there are all these cooperative efforts that have this idea that the effort that goes into making a platform succeed is not an effort and doesn't count. And, and so, so number one, I wanna elevate this enormous, gigantic centering, central effort that I feel is just completely discounted. And then your point was further, how do you make sure that that isn't owned? Let's go to Airbnb. How do we make sure that the three founders and the seven investors don't get all the value and the rest of us get screwed? So as I was thinking about this, and in this chapter in particular, is I want to enunciate first off that financing or building one of these platforms for coordination costs a huge amount of money, and most of them fail. You can think of the, if you're an old person like me, think of all the cooperatives or the cooperative ideas or the things you've started that have failed. So darn many of them have failed. So I think there's, we've got to recognize that I don't see us as individuals are going to be willing and able to finance many cooperatives that are going to fail just straight off the bat and i want to recognize the value of money that it takes some of these take millions and i can see doc squirming in his seat here <laughs> I feel mm -hmm. like it takes millions of dollars to to finance 
the building of these where most of them are going to fail. So let's talk about where the value goes. And this is what I'm kind of totally intrigued by when I think about the blockchain and coming to your second question about Ostrom's work um, is I think where is value created? There's value creation in building the platform. There's value creation in people working on that platform. So let me just do the Airbnb example. And then there's value creation in the network effects. So Airbnb from day zero, I could put my house on it, my, I could put my bedroom on it, and then someone could rent it. And I, as a bedroom renter, got paid and I was reimbursed and it should be fine because otherwise I wouldn't have done it. If it hadn't been remunerative to me, I wouldn't have done it. Meanwhile, Airbnb founder company, it took them four years, I'm making this up, four years and how many tens of millions of dollars to build the platform before they made a penny. Like they were in the red, 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 and now they made some money. The problem, and meanwhile, we hosts and we people going, each and every transaction worked out for us, otherwise we wouldn't have done it. But meanwhile, there's this third piece of value that is enormous, which is the network effects. If that Airbnb and the platform accrued all that money. So the fact that Airbnb, people go to Airbnb because I'm making up a number, there's a million places to rent and I've heard about it and I know about it. And so I'm going because there are a million places and I know there's gonna be one near me. That was created by all the individual users. So how do we get those individual users who created the network effects to get value? And again, this comes back to who's creating those rules of engagement and using things like the blockchain and this sourcing, how can we give individuals, or I would say Airbnb founders could have, how do we give these individuals, how do we recognize that the network effect has value? And I'm gonna separate that out from platform building. And so to your piece around, you know, do people do bad things? They do do bad things and you need these network coordinators to, in the beginning, if you've built a company, you're making it all up and you're making the initial rules because there isn't a community and there isn't anyone to talk to and you're just making it all up. And then over time, you can start having a community that says, what do we think of that first rule Robin Chase made up? Is it the right rule? Is it the wrong rule? Should it be more? Should it be less? But we have to be honest that in the beginning, someone's got to make it up. Someone's got to think it up. There isn't a community there. There isn't that activism. That was a long answer. Sorry, a little mini rant. Thank you. <laughs> um, Johannes had his hand up and then David Mackey. First, I want to say that um, that I'm very glad I came to this talk. It is very rare that somebody weaves so many different strands together into a cohesive whole. Uh, and I'm I glad think, you, you know, cohesive. Uh, yes, but you know, we have so many problems, and that sometimes we are overwhelmed because from the climate to the politics to the you know everything it seems separate. But I think there is a consistent sort of line of thinking here of what the problem is and how uh, the shape of the the solution. So my question is this: Let's imagine for a second the revolution has come. Uh, sometime in the future, uh, whatever a reasonable time frame is, the revolution has come and things have worked out the way more or less as they were supposed to, according to the way you think about this. How exactly did that happen? It seems to me that, for example, the large platforms today, at least the most influential ones, are sort of as far away from a you know participatory comments as we can think of, Facebook being the number one uh, uh, at the list. Um, where do we get new platforms? Do we get the platforms to change? Where where are the levers and how did it fall into place if it was all successful um, looking backwards? Isn't that so? I feel a sentence that you're making me want to say that I say giving these talks is we need to speed the pace of evolution, right? We need to speed the pace of transition. And so what are the ways that we create this transition? And I think there's going to be a lot of ways the ways that I think a whole bunch of people wish would happen is we have some incredibly magnanimous, fantastic innovators who build fantastic, spectacular platforms, don't get corrupted by power and money, don't believe they need to own 10, $20 billion and 10 million is enough and they do all the right things. That would be great. And I think we'll have some of them. We have examples of some of them. As I was, there are some commons that are new and we have examples of them. So that would be one path. Another path will be that there are startup innovator entrepreneurs who have these desires, who are leveraging these new mechanisms and can build something new de novo quickly and start with these better, these more thoughtful 
more world encompassing, more equal ideas. And I and and I want to say I I my son once I was talking about universal basic income, and he said to me, "Well, there should be a uni What's the maximum income? And I thought, yes, what is the maximum income? So it'd be another, we need, if we had a maximum income, just tell me what it is. Is it 1 million? Is it 10 million? Is it a billion? Whatever it is, there's so many more people on top of that that we could, you know, so how, so, so I think the transition will also come through that in the transition. And it just is, it's maddening to me. And I need some political person to help me is politics and the existing rules the existing laws and the existing rules are so broken and entrenched and it's really hard to change those fast. And so those bad incentives that exist continue, perpetuate the system. And I mean, this is around racism and this is around um, the excesses of capitalism. And this is around societies that don't have enough money. Um, so how do, so I guess I don't have, I, when I look at it, I just think, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna try to deal in it, deal with this in as many ways as I personally am skilled at, which has nothing to do with politics. I can't figure out how to answer it to make those changes, but I can work with entrepreneurs and I can encourage big companies to do the right thing. So David, you wanna? Yes, mm -hmm. thanks. Thanks, Doc. Um, I guess I'd like to start first by thanking you, Robin. Um, a truly inspirational. We have big challenges ahead of us, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank the, the people who put this together. And I know, Doc, you're, you, you always take the front row, but there's also other people behind you. So, so I want to thank you on, on, to everyone who brought us together. And then to get to my question, I want to follow up on what Johannes was, was driving towards, which is how to make this happen. And I'd like to just, but I'd like to be a little more specific and I'd like to connect some things, some words you said, Robin, when you talked about experimentation and you talked about value. And I'm not, I, I want to, not get caught up, and I personally get caught up very much in this larger problems that we have, but if you look at finding value that can be applied, that is called entrepreneurship, and there are mechanisms within entrepreneurship typically that have been driven by money, but don't, the mechanisms don't have to be driven by money. Can you, can you help uh, sort of focus in on entrepreneurship, and how do we make practical experiments. And that's the, the question is very specific on that. So thank you. Um, one of the things I was once on a federal government committee on innovation and entrepreneurship with some other fancier people and people of all, but mostly fancy people. And something that was making me crazy was there was this idea and, it's, and you see it in tax laws you know, that, oh my God, don't do things because you have to, you have to make sure that people can make huge sums of money. Otherwise people won't innovate. And I think, have you ever, if you talk to anybody who's actually succeeded, they were totally passionate about their thing. It was not doing it to make tons of money. It was doing, cause it was fascinating, just incredibly fascinating to them. How do I build this thing that I think should exist in the world? And so uh, somehow so I so I wanted I wanted to say overtly I want to divorce the idea that making gobs of money is a an impetus to innovation. I don't think I don't believe that to be true. And when I talk to people who have built companies, that was not the driving force. That said, access to capital is critical, and I struggled with that mightily when I was building Zipcar. And it's one of the things that was leading me to figure out this piece around excess capacity is that because I didn't have any money, I really had to think much harder. Um, there was this funny sentence that I read someplace in a book and I'm always so sad I can't attribute it well and I'm gonna repeat it poorly, but I loved it, which was the Romans did everything the Greeks could do, but without any money. They just did it smarter because they didn't have the money. And I thought, that's how I felt as an entrepreneur. You just had to do it smarter because you didn't have the money. Um, the, what I think we are lacking at this moment is small amounts of money that we give 
instead of big amounts, that small amounts take entrepreneur. So if we think about innovation, or I want to say addressing climate change, that we throw gobs of money and huge amounts to big entities, and it's been spinning wheels. And if you think about throwing small amounts of money to very, very hyper-local people, they can sometimes succeed on small amounts of money. And if they fail, it's on small amounts of money. That there's just this ability. So I would love us to, to place many more small bets that we need to place many more small bets right now because we've been placing big bets and they have not been producing. Um, and so I feel like that's this place. So I was just thinking about my personal small amount of charity giving in the, just because of December. And I was doing everything I could to think about, okay, who are, what are small BIPOC run community organizations that are doing innovative things? That here are people who don't ever, aren't getting any money, are filled with passion, are their ear is right next to the ground. Whereas big, we just keep throwing money at the same people to answer these problems and they are not doing it. I kind of wondered. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. Doc, oh, sorry, muted. I was mute. Mary, you're next. Mary. And then Kevin and then Kevin Cox. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could give an example of um, throwing money at a big, um, a big thing uh, as a- Electric as a, cars. In an attempt. Electric okay. cars. Oh my <laughs> God. And so one of the things I was doing in the back channeling was when they're doing the build back better, how many, I, I got asked this question from a legislative aide, how many money should we- putting into subsidizing electric vehicles. And I thought zero, zero money to people buying electric cars. 90% of car owners own their own home. The average car owner is like 56 years, 53 years old in the US and has more than 200, 20% have more than $200,000 of income. So zero money for that. So it's just maddening to me. However, paying for charging stations that can be shared, not charging station outside in, in my yard for me, Robin Chase, who should not be subsidized for anything, but you know, in a public parking lot, yeah, we should be building those. So I think there's just, yeah, supporting. What about, what about um, the notion, I just, because of what you just mentioned, I agree with you, but what about the notion of um, offering to subsidize uh, swapping a car that is a, is a gas engine for an electric, set up is that viable or no i mean so it's i get another, it's not been developed right now but um that so there was a cash for clunkers program that was put up by a friend of mine that i like but it was in my view a dismal failure um it the old cars just went straight to other people who just kept driving them and there was no net reduction in co2 at all and i guess you're pushing me towards the, my transportation self, which um, the short form will be, it will never, ever, ever make environmental or economic sense to have you drive a two ton vehicle to move your 150 pound body. Never, whether it's electric or not, that will never make sense. And that's how 70% of the trips are run in this country. So cars are not the answer for transportation, period. And the, the answer to transportation is, Let's change how we build our communities. Let's make these small village communities where most of your trips you do by walking, biking, public transit. And cars are an exception that you use exceptionally. Um, sorry, I got onto my high horse. So that's okay. What, um, so the other part of the question is, can you give some, a couple of examples of small investments that we should be making right now simultaneously to address climate change? Yeah, in the transportation sector, the piece that I'm really working on is I think the rise of electric bikes is game changing and they have been selling out. They, I think the, I think it was a 250% increase um, over the last of sales of 2021 over 2020. And I have this another beautiful chart that it's 
there's more electric bikes as vehicles being sold right now than electric vehicles. But so the corollary with that, is so they're cheaper, people don't have to spend between 17 and 80% of their income on this vehicle to move themselves around. Everyone can afford it. But the corollary is we do have to use a, some of our newfound infrastructure investment to build a safe infrastructure. And no, I don't think people will be using their bikes for everything, but they can be using their bikes in a dramatically different way. You can be shedding second cars. You'll be completely transforming the autonomy of um, people who don't own cars or don't have money, don't have driver's licenses, which is about 50% of the people. So in the transportation sector, for me, the number one thing we can do right now is to reduce car dependency and move us to, because we have this new thing, electric bikes. And if anyone on this call hasn't tried one, go try one. You'll feel like a superhuman. <laughs> they're, they're great. I just want to, I want to move through. We have other people. Some was raised hands, some not. Kevin, go ahead. Kevin's in, in uh, Canberra, Australia, by the way. So Hello, we're, Kevin. we're yeah. spanning the world here. Look, I, I want to um, just give a little anecdote, if you like, or, or a little description of what, what we're involved in just at the moment um, that I think um, will give you some hope. <laughs> uh, we're in a, uh, in a city that's, that's pretty good. Uh, it's, it's a great, great place to live. And we, we have a, a government that is actually trying to keep it a great place. Which is which is really nice. Um, <laughs> uh, I live in Canberra, the capital, like the Washington DC of, of the US. Um, uh, and the, the the government has decided to try and make our houses sustainable. And so, in order to do that, they've said, "Well, we will give people an incentive to make their houses a little bit more sustainable." And we'll do it by, um, by uh, offering them interest-free loans, um, providing that they spend it on something that will make their house a bit more sustainable, like putting on solar panels or buying a battery or um, doing what have you, what, whatever you wish to do. So they put in place this, uh, this proposal. The only trouble is that... Uh, <laughs> uh, and I turn out to be one of the victims of, of the problem associated with this is that um, they offer the interest-free loans, but you then have to go to a financier to actually get the loan. And um, they won't give me a loan um, uh, in order to... Um, in order to be able to make my house more sustainable. And they won't give me a loan because I'm too old. And the rules on person, because the rules that the finances are using is that the um, is that the uh, uh, in order to get a loan, you have to be able to get a even if it's an interest free loan, you have to be able to qualify for a personal loan. And once you get to a certain age, so the regulations and the bureaucracy did not work out. Yeah, yeah I think there's a lot they, of nuances. They, yeah. They won't give you a personal loan, even if it's an interest-free loan. Um, no matter what, no matter what uh, other assets you have or anything else associated with it, they simply won't give you a, a personal loan. Um, so I can't get a loan to make my house more sustainable. So the solution that we're we're coming up with is one that um, that. Uh, is, is to actually join, make a cooperative and let the cooperative get the loan because it's the rules associated with it are, are such that even if I do drop dead, um, the cooperative will take over the loan. That's a brilliant idea. And one of the things um, I was thinking about this idea of, average, of a platform on leveraging excess capacity was we can think about business improvement districts or house districts where there are people who have assets you know, being, the banks would be willing to do these loans based on their assets and I'd be willing to, to lend it because I know that person is my neighbor and we have these shared interests. So I think that's a really um, lovely idea is pooling assets of these physical house 
building assets in ways where you actually do know your neighbors and you have this joint, we want our neighborhood to be better. Yeah, and, and the other thing that actually happens with this is that um, I get my interest-free loan, um, the cooperative uh, guarantees it um, uh, effectively, but as I pay for, as I, I still have to pay for my electricity, um, as I pay for my electricity, so the capital accumulates to me. So one way of being able to spread the wealth um, and, to, and to evolve the system is to take our existing systems and make the processes whereby we pay for things also transfer to us part of the capital of the business that produces the things. This, yeah. by doing this, um, I believe we can actually evolve our existing big businesses so that they're owned by the people. I think that's, it's an interesting, it's interesting and I'm actually trying to figure out how to do that with electric bikes. But I, I just wanna say, I, I like the idea, but the details really matter. That just figuring out the, that the person who laid down the initial capital has to be getting their share in addition because they had to pay the, their debt, like whatever. It's just a, it's mm -hmm. a fine grained, I, I agree with you. And I think that there's, it's a tricky and good idea in certain circumstances that there's enough value and price and too much profit for that all to work. It's a lovely idea. I, I invite people to look at, uh, and I put one link here, LinkedIn, link in uh, Kevin. There are probably some others you could, should put in the, in the chat. Um, Joyce and I met Kevin uh, maybe a decade ago in Germany, and we've been totally fascinated by his ideas ever since. Um, and he also was a college professor, who, but he was very successful in business as well. So he's, he's got, he has the goods. Um, I, I wanted to pivot briefly to uh, the byway, which is our project at uh, at uh, in in Bloomington at IU and with the Ostrom Workshop. Um, actually, uh, uh, what what Bruce said a bit earlier in the chat: make Commons innovations visible, supported, and celebrated by, by a Commons based platform. We're working on that. Um, we actually have some code underway um, using open source code. We have a student on the on the case and, um, and the idea is to knit together demand and supply in the marketplace uh, in ways that, that centralized platforms like Amazon and eBay and Etsy cannot. So I invite you to look at, um, I put that in the chat as well. So I don't see any other hands up. So I'm gonna reach out to, um, uh, to Bill Wendell. Bill has been active in the, <laughs> in the, in the chat here and he's also based in Cambridge, as is Robin, and um, and has been working on the real estate case. Are you there, Bill, or have you dropped off? I don't know. Maybe he's dropped off. Huh. I don't. I don't see him now. Oh, too bad. Um, so okay, I will go look at that stuff. So there's Barbara. Barbara just raised her yeah, hand. Yeah, I was manually. just going to offer a thought when Robin, when you were discussing how you were on a um, a group or committee that had uh, noted people and they kept focusing on money, um, <laughs> it brought to mind something very important that I learned from Don, the late Don Fry, who um, was a professor at Northwestern and uh, his area was innovation entrepreneurship. He was the head engineer that designed the Mustang at Ford and was CEO of Bell and & Howell. And on, upon retirement to academia, he focused on innovation entrepreneurship. And what he kept focusing on were truly understanding what the process of innovation and entrepreneurship is. In this respect, he always emphasized it requires champions and resources. But the whole idea is that there are many ways in which you can find champions and resources is what it seemed to me that you were stressing that. Um, and so understanding the critical roles of champions for innovation and getting resources and the multiple ways in which they can manifest themselves 
it requires um, more, a little more complex thinking. And this is where polycentricity comes in too with governance, mm -hmm. the different ways things could happen. And part of what his legacy was, he helped found um, what euphemistically became known as the incubator at Northwestern, which was through funding uh, permitted different things to be developed, which is where US robotics got founded eventually and things like that. So I just wanted to share, and he was, uh, Don Fry was also awarded the Medal of Technology in, under the first President Bush. Um, I think it was the first President Bush. Um, at any rate, um, it just brought to mind that, you know, that's why when you get people on these groups or committees to make sure that they're more, um, that they aren't too caught up in a single paradigm, like the capitalist paradigm or whatever, yeah. about how to think about these things. So I just wanted to share that. that I learned that at the heel or at the, you know, at the foot of, of Don Fry. This was back in the 90s when I was working in my PhD. And it still seems to really resonate today. And, I, and I, again, like you talked about some of these other people, he was very multidisciplinary in his background between actually working in industry, in academia, and all these different people. So I just didn't know to what extent that might also be helpful that these, these views actually have been around, but we've got to um, get them to grab hold more, you know. Uh, we've got to scale up our understanding of these things. There are experts in that. People whose research is that. Yes. Um, I'm just looking at the time and worried about you. And I see Joyce. And so Joyce and Doc, tell us. And jo Joyce's hand is up. So go, go ahead, Joyce. Uh, hi. So, um, yeah, and I think we can hang on if anybody wants to hang on. We, we can hang on. Right, Isak? Um, yeah, cool. Um, so a couple of things, thoughts that I had as you're talking, Robin, and um, one of them, first of all, is to connect you for sure with Kevin Cox, because he's thought very deeply about like all those details that you were just yep. mentioning. Yep. He really, he really has. <laughs> and so that you should continue on some very innovative stuff about ways to um, ways to uh, fund things that are very different than what we have with capitalism, strictly. Um, and then the other thing is part of what you were talking about, and I don't remember what was in one of the slides about um, not just the local, but that there's, you know, that money goes more and more and more, the way I read it anyways, anyway, was to financialization of activity rather than the actual value of the activity. Uh, and um, I'm feeling like that that's one of the things that we're really trying to do with the byway is push it down to the local level so that people, you know, the, the woman who is, you know, collects the, the, the Mickey Mouse collectibles or the woman who, or the man who collects uh, used farm tools will find the audience that cares about this directly well, without having to go through, and we always call it the platform, but I, I've come to understand the way you talk about flat platform is that, you know, there needs to be, a, it's mo almost more like a metaphor. There's both, it's a real thing that you need the technology to do it, but that the platform itself isn't a good thing or a bad thing. It's just that does it serve the needs of all the people who are, are the stakeholders, the, you know, the actual users themselves, not just the people who manage to put the technology together. So those are just a couple of comments that I have. Um, I, I just think about platforms and we have, we share another mutual friend, Brett Fleischman, I, who works on platforms and infrastructure. And I feel like platforms are kind of scaffolding to empower, to empower and make things easier, faster, more convenient. Right, so that is I would define as a platform in that general way. Um, so there's lots of different ways to look at it, and I think this experimentation. So if I think about byways, I think I do like the idea of using an RSS feed as a different way of getting at it. It's kind of an interesting, interesting piece. Um, but the challenge for everything is how do you get usership and build a community. And all of that is very effortful. That's for sure. 
I'm I'm getting distracted now by the uh, Johannes' by the hand. Chat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Johannes' hand is up. Yes, you're So there. yes, so you know, as we're talking about platforms in the plural, I'm wondering how are all these platforms related? Are they related? Do they need to be related? And if so, if we are looking towards um, change that is faster than the established ways of changing uh, can produce, are there some platforms that exist or do not exist yet need to be built that ha have a privileged position in terms of making the change faster? Is there a lever? Is there a platform that levers other platforms? And I'm sort of thinking out loud and there may not be an answer for, for that um, question. I, well, so one, I don't think platforms are connected. I mean, I, I use this word really broadly. And a slide that I'm just wondering when I cut down my Peers Inc. slide and why I'm so fascinated by this organizational structure, I'm not going to share screen, it'll take too long. But um, I will say the words. If we think about um, instead of inventing Zipcar, I could have said, I want to build the largest hotel chain in the world and i'm going to do it in four years i'm going to build you know i'm going to get the land i'm going to hire the architects i'm going to get the financing i'm going to get all those things built all those rooms built and i'm going to hire the staff and it's going to be no problems and i'm going to do it in four years and you and everyone listening to me would say that's physically impossible that is 100 physically impossible you couldn't build the largest hotel chain in the world airbnb did it and matched the number of rooms as the largest hotel chain in four years why because they were leveraging existing assets in existing localities that didn't have to be built de novo, de novo. And they brought them together on this platform in a new and unique way that was necessary. So there was incentives for people to get on it. There were the rules of engagement, whether you like them or not, there was standards and consistency. And so that's, I look at that and I think, that is what gives me optimism. I think, wow, what is the nut that we can crack that leverages existing assets and existing humans deep in their disparate localities? Because that's the only way we're going to make this responses at the scale mm -hmm. we need. And so I'm, yeah. So if you have to build something from scratch, we don't have, we don't have time for that, you know, 1.05% of the population can be building whatever crazy technology solution that people are believing is going to happen. And that's going to take 25 years and it might work out. But to get stuff done today, we have to leverage existing assets. And it's going to be in the way that that scales and gets replicated is a platform that makes that activity simpler, faster, convenient, the incentives are all aligned. Um, so I, I say these words and I believe these words, but it's been my challenge of the last five years since I understood this mechanism. It's hard. I, I see I see Bill is back. Um, I just uh, messaged him on his side, asked him if he wants to weigh in. I don't know if you're listening in now or bill if you feel like it but if you do now's the time sure i'll, I'll just say a word um, let's see robin is a neighbor broadly speaking so i loved what she said about neighbor to neighbor and as mary uh underlined housing differences housing is different around the country but we have twin problems of both ownership and rental housing so I couldn't be more excited about the potential of the byway in real estate. And although, Robin, I think I agree with you at some level that these things take a long time to buy, excuse me, to build. But one in four homes now is selling under seven days. But I would imagine those are decisions made over seven months, if not seven years, from the selling side of the transaction. So I think there's a generation of baby boomers who are represent pent up demand. In fact, one of four of them say they want to move after the pandemic. I think there's an opportunity to create new ways of signaling those intentions to move, intention to buy, intention to sell. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you for sure, there are small demonstration projects happening every time someone puts out a for sale by owner sign. And I'm just left 
thing when when you started saying that that you know, people are buying in seven days or whatever, and it's pent up demand, and that that decision has been thought through for months and thwarted and thwarted and thwarted and thwarted, and my decision making, my necessary time to make the decision has been collapse, 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 because I keep not getting right or whatever. So now I say, okay, I can, you know, I'm gonna see the house, walk through, and I, before I go out the door, I say, I'm gonna, I want it. Um, but it was generated through this past. And the thing about excess capacity, it seems to me that there's got to have been, Google for sure would know, but, um, you know, what are the, the signups, the, the searches, the signals that are making quite clear that I'm a thwarted home buyer. And so I feel like it's easy. It seems like it's identifying those people is a really, they aren't, they aren't made in seven days. They are made over months <laughs> getting to that point. Yes. And uh, in previous conversations, we've talked with Doc and, Doc and Joyce about transition as a service. A lot of boomers are locked in their houses emotionally, sometimes physically, other times financially. But a, an intergenerational handoff is coming. It will be tens of millions of households. And I think we have an opportunity here to do some extraordinary work. And I look forward to doing I, it with you. Um, I told a young um, a millennial who's my daughter's age, who lives in Cambridge, who can't. I was walking by a house and I said, and I sent her the address. And I said, you can look at this house. It's an old person who's living there who really cannot fiddle with what's the name of the plumber? Let me get this, you know, the sewer, the gutters, the blah, blah, blah. And I'm pretty sure you could go in there and say, I'd like to own half of your house and I will take care of all these things for you. <laughs> that there would be, you know, that there are definitely ways. There are demonstration projects like that waiting to happen and let's start them soon. <laughs> yep. Something that I don't know if you touched on it, Bill, or not, because I'm busy working the back channel and stuff. But there's uh, going on in, in real estate right now is a financialization aspect of it. it on the one hand, there are cartels of, um, of real awful. estate agencies. And on the other hand, there are lots of entities, large corporate entities that are driving up prices in a way by just throwing offers all over the place. We have a friend, I mentioned this in the chat, lives in Houston. Um, I believe the second house she owns is one she inherited from her mother or something like that. One of those generational things. And uh, she gets daily offers. I mean, she's renting it right now, but you know, it's daily offers and they're all from companies. They're all from investment companies. What are they going to do with them? It, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, that's a, that's a factor that's driving things up. And, you know, we have this whole generation that, that, that the dream of home ownership somehow is, <laughs> is it there, you know? But I also think about these regulatory and tax structures that I feel like those are platforms and pieces of, those are pieces of infrastructure that are forcing or encouraging and incentivizing certain ways of decision making. Absolutely. And, and so how, I mean, that's the whole political realm. How do we go into those regulations and those tax rules and those tax loopholes to transform. So those things don't happen. Um, well, it, it, it seems to me, and I may be wrong about this, but um, that the, the cartels in the real estate industry, which is increasingly corporatized, um, much as, for example, healthcare is, um, Healthcare is a B2B insurance business. It's not one that we're involved with. Um, and they, they own the regulators, right? The, the regulators aren't going to, are not going to do anything for us, I would think. I don't know. But, but if ESOC, by the way, gets elected to Congress, maybe we can make this happen. I should point out that ESOC is, is running for Congress in our district in, in Bloomington. But I mean, do we see hope there? I mean, maybe ESOC, you have a, an answer there. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and she's tilting her head. <laughs> um, I just missed last night, a, a friend of mine um, followed Jamie Raskin around for three and a half years. Oh, wow. And did a documentary that aired last night on MSNBC called Love and the Constitution. And I was unable to get it. <laughs> um, 
But that said, she chose to do this documentary on him because she said, she lives in his district, and she said, I was, it was, it was a Trump response that she was looking for. She wanted to follow politicians who really appeared to act with the good of their constituents in mind. And so Isaac, I, um, I didn't mean to, um, <laughs> if, you, if you're going to become one of those politicians, I really hope you know, I'm behind you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Isaac, you're not much of a politician that when given the mic, you don't just grab it. <laughs> this is, I'm not going to stand on Robin's platform. I was here to listen. <laughs> <laughs> She's giving it to you. There you go. I, 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 not, not, I won't. I, I actually had like a lot of thoughts, but, but just a, you know, I, I think something that's percolating in my mind is that, you know, there's this really interesting tension that we're discussing between, um, identifying value with sort of other market forces, right? Um, the existence of rent seeking in the economy, right? And then getting around all of those things to, to, to you know, to move toward collective action. And I think, you know, as, as relates to Doc's point, just the one about healthcare, I mean, the people who are running our healthcare industry don't add any value to the economy, right? And so, um, you know, and that's sort of anathema to any sort of capitalist system. So I think that ties really well into how you started the conversation by saying like, right, like. Except when they don't add value, what we do know about capitalism is that transactions are value. And so we have the whole financial fiasco they, we add value them to them being, they're not adding value to yes us, correct correct right? and, so and, in and, the economy as we've set it up yep transactions are value and so that's right. why they persist in this horrid horrid way yeah well tra yeah transactions are money for the rent seeker and and so i mean the you know this analogous to what doc always talks about in terms of the internet i think that we're living in a time where where the vast majority of the systems in place are just rent seeking systems, right? And so. Um... So it's interesting. One of the, and think of how we favor, um, we favor capital um, right. over, with taxation, it's heavily right. favored, and labor is not. And so I feel like there are these statistics that I don't have by heart, but there's a statistic like in the 1980s, these three largest firms in America, it was like three car companies and something employed. 1 million people and had one person, whatever percent of the GDP. And today's top three companies hire 56,000 people and are whatever. So we really have to completely flip our taxation, right? You don't want to tax things you want to incentivize. And we have to completely transform yeah. how we tax labor and how we tax capital. Like I just yeah. think we have so to switch true. that investment. Yeah. Completely yeah, that was what we were talking, what I was saying in the part of your presentation where you talk about, you know, like, where's the value created? Uh, and, and, and we see it happening both, both in healthcare and real estate, which were kind of like the last bastions of, you know, small business, you could, you could be a small landlord, you could be a doctor in a town, but now like all the doctors, they're selling out to hedge funds that are going to, you know, run the software for it and run their management because it's gotten too complicated. And people are now selling their houses to, because they don't want the hassle of actually, you know, calling the plumber, like you said, but they would like an income stream. So normal people are seeing the only way to get, um, to get an ongoing rep to be part of this, this financialization is to sell what they have and be part of the financialization stream. Like the new products that are being made up to financialize every little aspect, it'll be your, it'll be your electric bikes next. So, I mean, I, I so, think we really have to fight back on this. Um, I would, I feel like we're getting into a part that's very depressing. And so I would love to open the conversation up for some, um, Things that are giving people optimism at this moment. I want to say the rise of electric bikes and the potential and how I can make that happen faster is something that is giving me some optimism. But what are what are things that are giving people optimism? I, I I'll just jump in very briefly. I I the, the two things that give me optimism are one that we are very early in a very long era in which we are all going to be digital as well as as physical. And we're, we're very early to even knowing what it means to be digital as well as physical beings. And, 
and to become embodied in, in this virtual world. And we're doing it right now. It's amazing. We're people all over the earth here in one place at roughly no cost, which is a, a miracle on the order of loaves and fish, maybe even beyond that. So that gives me some optimism because I think we've just barely begun to, to, to plumb what's possible here. And, I, and the second thing is just human ingenuity. I think human beings are amazingly ingenious. And the more stressed they are and the harder the circumstances are, they are just even more um, uh, original in how they approach things. So, so those two things give me just a lot of, uh, a, lot of a, a sense of a cause for optimism. On the other hand, I'm watching, you know, I know that Bangladesh and Florida will be underwater in a matter of time. And that's also depressing. depressing. But in the meantime, I, I put some, not stock as a, you know, but whatever, some, some faith in, in human ingenuity. David has had his, Mackie's had his hand up and so has Johannes. Thanks, thanks Doc. Yeah, um, but, I, but I didn't mean to hog the question because other people <laughs> should answer your question, Robin. I'm sorry about that. We'll start with David on that, I guess. Well, I, the, I have a question and it may not be so much on future optimism as opposed to, Robin, your past success. And one of the slides I was just thinking about as we were talking, one of the slides you, you put up were pictures of your customers who were you know, clients or what, you know, people who were coming out of the hospital and they were so connected to your organization that they sent you pictures. So there's a, there's a success that you have had connecting with people. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the early days on how did you become successful connecting with those people? Were there any techniques? Was it random? Just curious if you can talk about that, I'd appreciate um, it. I, I feel like I have opinions on that. And then I wanna couch my opinions in that this is in the early 2000s before people had way too much stuff coming into their email mailboxes. So I had an open rate of like 85%. And there were two things that we so the things that we did was um, it would take me like a day to write something, right? Like mm -hmm. communicate with people, um, with all members. And I tried to be humorous. I tried to have very short forms so you could read, you could skim, they're skimmable and, and humorous so that you would want to actually read every word. So you could rely on it being something that was interesting. But one of the things that I did is if you've ever run a service business, um, you're constantly dealing with exceptions and bad behavior. And so the staff are feeling like, wow, everyone completely sucks. Like humans are just terrible. They're like mistreating the cars, whatever. But the reality is that's a teeny tiny percentage of the much larger thing. So in these emails, I would be constantly storytelling about how this service was changing people's lives and how these members were helping each other in these ways. And these are the ways people were kind to each other, helpful to each other, or things that they did. And what I realized in hindsight is that I was, um, and just one other little thread to pull into there, I was once so amused that like when a politician comes to the farmer's market and then he shakes people's hands and then people go vote for that person. And I think, like, I don't understand how shaking your hand at the farmer's market makes me want to vote for you. <laughs> Coming back to these emails, what I found, what I learned was, as a, as a storyteller, you are picking out exceptions and making people feel like they belong. And so it's not as if I, I could make, so I was making my staff believe oh, people are all kind and good and our members are fantastic as a corollary to make them not think, wow, people are really, I'm racing around to cars that people didn't clean up or didn't whatever. So, so I was able to be this storyteller that made people love the company, feel like they were one of us. I would ask for advice. I would tell them how they were fantastic, how they were changing the world. And um, I also, when we screwed up, I was also very overt in the screwing up that I would say, oh, you know, we're this young company and I totally mispriced this thing or wow, the insurance company has just doubled the rates. So I'm going to have to do something or, you know, like I was transparent in my values and my goals and my trials. 
And so we are all in this together going forward. And um, to this piece about capitalism, I have such mixed feelings about it in that I believe that Zipcar was able to build what it was when I was running it. And even now I wanna say it's an environmentally positive thing, even if the devil runs it, it it's an environmentally upside. But I was, it was because of capitalism that I could build this thing with my own hand, own two hands that did this good thing because of the mechanism of capitalism. Um, on the flip side, we, and yet when I was doing that, I was trying to provide a value service. I wasn't trying to always take capture what the market will bear. I was trying to make a sustainable company that would have profits that matched the value and that would produce a sustainable company. I wasn't trying to price gouge. So it, I feel like so capitalism has this flip is that I think it's just no restraint to it that the more you can get the better the more you can extract the better and that is very pointing so how so I'm not ready so while I I think we're in late stage capitalism ideally we would figure out how to rewrite our laws so that we can maintain some of its upsides in that currency does capture lots of attributes you know its environmental footprint, does it hire people? Is this one more expensive, this one cheaper? Dollars do do all that. But the problem is we don't, there's a whole bunch of stuff that isn't in that equation. As in who are you extracting from? Who are you paying poorly? Which things are you throwing into the earth that you're not paying for? So Johannes, your hand has been up for a while. So on the question of optimism, um, I want to uh, provide two pieces for that one. Number one, unlike 10 years ago, to, or, or even longer back, today we all know we have a problem. We describe the problem differently, but it's generally known that we have a problem. Things cannot co go continue the way they have. And uh, you know, before that insight, no change is possible. Now, that makes the change possible because we know we have a problem. We don't know yet how to solve it, but we know we have a problem. And secondly, the sheer amount of innovation that is happening in various places um, is just staggering. And I want to specifically pull out some of the obscure corners in the crypto world. I mean, the, the whole crypto world, uh, the whole blockchain world has been getting a lot of hate lately um, for all sorts of uh, good reasons. But there is uh, pockets of innovations around, specifically out, uh, around governance that are just mind boggling uh, in, the, in the sense of what people are coming up with. Now, most of this is never gonna work in practice, uh, but that's how it is with early innovation. All sorts of people play with all sorts of things. And then at some point, something interesting can pops up and somewhere between your know, platform co-ops and, uh, and uh, crypto uh, organized uh, you know, international tribes uh, with, the, with you know, community owned platforms and so forth. I think we, we, have, uh, we have some real possibility to actually accomplish something. We not at the point yet, but I think um, something will pop up there. Um, I'm, I'm totally optimistic around that one. That's if we go back to the beginning days of the internet and what we were hoping it would provide, that it does provide, is it amplifies, there's a certain point, part of it that's a meritocracy and that, you know, everyday users can, good ideas can spread widely as well as we know bad ideas. But so you're right, it's really, the tools we have at hand are exciting. And just thinking about optimism, when we talked about government policy, that was the piece that the pandemic provide in terms of optimism is it showed, wow, you know, the government when motivated can turn on a dime. You know what, it can, we can just motivate them. Let me add one more quick thing about it. So I'm in the middle of Silicon Valley and interesting enough, um, not that long ago, the vast majority of conversations among entrepreneurs and would-be entrepreneurs was gigantic amounts of uh, you know money to be made. There is now many many people who uh, are uh, not leading with that one. They're leading with there is a problem that needs to be solved here. And I think if the if if if, if we are at this point where the people who are change agents are beginning to redirect themselves from one objective build the largest possible company, building the biggest, you know, toll booth you can to something that, yeah, we need want to have that too. But the primary reason of why I'm doing this is something else. <laughs> and I think that's great. 
That is great. That is. I'm glad to hear that. Anybody else want to weigh in with optimism or pessimism or uh, benediction? Because we've been at this for a while. <laughs> We're probably at a stopping point. It's been a, got an extra 30 yeah, minutes. Yeah, and Rob, Robin's going to say he has to go soon. Yeah, so okay. Yeah. Um, well, this has been great. I'm going to save off the chat. Others can do the same. Hey, will, you, will you mail me that? I saved I, it. I, I will send that. How I can get it. Thank you. It, it's a, most people don't know, but in the chat at the bottom. I see that, but where does it go when I say save it? Okay, it goes into a 